You're in the central part of the United States, over 100 feet below the surface of the earth, surrounded by thick, reinforced concrete. In the event of an attack, this entire structure can be sealed, protected against penetration of radioactive fallout. Through those doors and around the corner is the operations control room of the Long Range Air Offense Force. Thank you, Sergeant. From this room, the force throughout the world is controlled and monitored 24 hours a day, in peace as it would be in war. This force is a combat-ready offense force. It is a deterrent force dedicated to the prevention of war, any war, large or small. This offense force is complemented by the Joint Allied Early Warning Air Defense System. Offense control, Colonel Dawes. Good. Uh, recheck the weather in that area. The last forecast indicated thunderstorms. Right. Gentlemen, from this room, we control the entire long-range air offense force of 3,000 bombers, tankers, and support aircraft. It is a Joint Chiefs of Staff force which is poised, ready to strike targets anywhere in the world, from bases in the United States and overseas. It is the most powerful military force in world history. We are in contact with this force through the most advanced communication system ever built. It affords practically instantaneous communication with over 100 bases in the United States and our many bases overseas. Closed circuit television provides immediate information to the senior officers of the staff, enabling them to make vital decisions instantaneously. To transmit these decisions to the force, we have this red phone alert circuit. This circuit allows us by merely dialing 10 digits to seize or override all other lines and set up in a matter of seconds a conference call to the control centers on all our bases. All such conversations are recorded on these tape recorders here. Sitting over there are the controllers. For effective control of the long range offense force, the world is divided into three areas. Each man controls the aircraft in a given area. This is a deterrent force with a primary mission of keeping a global war from starting. If we are to be successful in this mission, we have to have plans. Plans of all kinds. Detailed blueprints, so to speak, that have been worked out far in advance. These are flexible plans and can be changed to meet any contingency. Let's have a look at some of the displays. Andy, uh, take over here, will you please? We call this the big board. These panels show missions in progress throughout the world. Some forces are being deployed, some are being shifted, some are special missions to improve combat effectiveness. These missions are going on 24 hours a day, and averaging the high activity periods with the lows, we have 10 to 15 percent of the total force airborne at all times. To support this activity, an aerial refueling operation takes place every three and a half minutes. See these clocks here? Never before in military history has time been so important. But of course our true mission here is to control this offense force. As I have said, it is a deterrent force. It's a force which we control in readiness to perform air strikes against an enemy. And in the event of war, when it would make these strikes. 
Sergeant, let's see plan war dance. Yes, sir. War dance is a typical war plan for our heavy units. The fate of the nation may well be determined on such a board as this. This plan of force application may be adjusted depending on the world situation. All the information needed to control the force is here. This board and other boards behind it dictate routes, refueling points, target areas, return points, and all the other things necessary to make the plan work. If the button's ever pressed, we're all set to go. You'll notice this ring of bases encircling the enemy. Every day we're running exercises in and around these bases with no formal pattern. Some of these exercises follow good tactics, but always we mix in many bad tactics which we would never actually use. Thus we keep the enemy from forming any idea of our real plans, and therefore from making his own plans to meet us. He knows we may use these bases, but he can have no idea which we'll use today, tomorrow, or if a war should start. And he knows we can launch our attack without them. During the time period 1958 through 1960, the United States has an offensive strike force sufficient to deter war. It's an effective intercontinental nuclear air force, secure as we can make it within our resources. A sizable portion of it is secure from destruction by the enemy regardless of what offensive and defensive action he takes against it. The size, composition, and alertness of the offense force is such that the enemy realizes that an attack on the United States would likely mean committing national suicide. A substantial portion of this force is maintained on constant alert, ready to begin taking off within a few minutes after receipt of the order to launch. This means that even with no more warning than that provided by our early warning radars, a force of hundreds of long-range nuclear bombers would be on their way toward vital targets in the enemy heartland before their bombers could reach our bomber bases. This constant combat readiness is the surest way to prevent war. This massive capability is the deterrent of wars. The more we disperse, the larger the portion of the force that can be launched on a few minutes' notice, and the more difficult it is for the enemy to convince himself of his ability to destroy it. The enemy cannot prevent the takeoff of these bombers on alert, and the enemy cannot prevent our penetration into his heartland as long as we maintain our relatively stronger deterrent force. But the enemy could someday gain greater strength and surpass our deterrent force. This must never happen. Nobody wins in nuclear war because both sides are sure to suffer terrible damage. Nevertheless, it is imperative that we make sure that the enemy can never impose his will upon us by military force. Despite our efforts to deter them, the communists may resort to general war. This is not considered likely to happen before the year 1960. If they start a war, this is what will happen. The early warning air defense net of the United States and our allies would pick up the first signs of unidentified aircraft. Defense control, urgent. This is air defense. Go ahead, air defense. We have a large number of unidentified aircraft coming in from the north. Our television camera covers our board at this moment. Roger, air defense, we see them. Sergeant Williams, stand by to establish a conference call to all bases. General Larson, please. This is General Larson, go ahead. Sir, would you turn on your screen? A large number of unidentified aircraft have just appeared. Right. Go ahead, air defense. This is air defense. 
Large groups of unidentified aircraft have been reported at Baffin and Prince of Wales Islands and near Banks Island. Reports from Alaska indicate unusual activity in northeast Siberia. We're considering reclassifying these unidentified aircraft to hostile because of the unusual number and tracks. Air defense, this is General Larson. Is your commander there? This is General Ryan. Go ahead. Jim, how does this look to you? I'm sure this is it, Dick, in view of the advance indication given us by Central Intelligence last night. More reports keep coming in all the time. We've just talked with our people in Alaska and to the Canadians. Both are picking up tracks. My crews are on five-minute alert. All our deployments have been accomplished. Our anti-aircraft missile sites are at full alert, ready to launch. How much time have I to get my aircraft off the ground? Our first check of their speed indicates you have about two and a half hours for your bases in the northern United States. That's a rough estimate, but I'll refine it as soon as we get a better look at them. That's close enough. I'm getting my people moving right away. We'll have a third of our force launched within 20 minutes. They'll be in strike configuration, but we'll not proceed beyond Applejack control line without further orders. Please keep us advised. Okay, Dick. Will do. Thanks, Jim. Pentagon, get me to join Chiefs. Bill, the alert force can go right now under plan quick strike with positive recall. How much we can save depends on how soon I can give the execution. What are your orders? The President and Joint Chiefs are with me in the command post. Implement quick strike. Repeat. Implement quick strike. I'll forward the release from recall the minute a decision is made. And good luck. Thanks. This is General Larson. Put plan quick strike into effect. Make sure the crews understand they are to stand by for the proceed to target order. I want the first aircraft airborne in five minutes from now. Have a third of our force on their way in 15 minutes. Let me know every 15 minutes what percentage of the remaining force is in minimum condition for takeoff. And what percentage fully loaded and combat operational. Also, how soon can we have a strike backup capability for the alert force? And another item. Remind the units that service evacuation of dependents is automatic with quick strike. Yes, sir. Put through the conference call. Notify our people in the Far East and Supreme Allied Command of Europe we're taking off. And tell them if we are authorized to proceed, all our strikes will be on the jointly coordinated series of targets. That is all. Yes, sir. Thank you. This is Colonel Dawes at Defense Force Headquarters. All units implement plan quick strike. H-hour is 1645 Z, repeat. H-hour is 1645 Zulu. Ensure the proceed to target order is understood by all crews. I say again, be sure all crews understand the proceed to target order. Dependent evacuation is automatic with this order, repeat. Dependent evacuation is automatic. Authentication is Mulberry. All stations acknowledge at the count of five. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> for quick strike has reached all offense force bases around the globe simultaneously.
addition of our bombers from the Strip Alert Force airborne within 15 minutes and anti-sabotage measures in full operation, the rest of the offense force in the United States and overseas is moving into positions ready for takeoff. A key part of this offense force is the B-52, the Stratofortress, with its crew of six highly skilled men. All the hard, rugged years and 15-hour practice missions, often from Arctic areas, are now going to pay off. Also part of this massive strike force is the B-58. of all these aircraft, the B-47s, the B-52s, and the B-58s have been carefully timed to take advantage of optimum tactics. Their KC-135 tankers are launching with them from their secure home bases. At some point, hundreds of miles from the home bases and high above all the clouds and weather, the KC-135 will deliver their fuel to one or more of the bombers. It is this fuel which will get the bombers to their targets at high or at low altitude, and which will bring many of them back home after the attack. All the planes, all the elements, fit into a plan to make the force operate as a precision instrument. While the alert force has been thrown into action, it can still be recalled, returned to home bases if the report of hostile aircraft proves false. These procedures ensure that the nation's offense force need not be held on the ground until the enemy attack develops as definite. Half an hour has passed since the first report of unidentified aircraft. In the control room, reports of the takeoffs and positions are being tabulated for the command staff under the supervision of the Director of Operations. General Larson, this is Turner. Are you? Go ahead, Dutch. Uh, sir, departure reports are being called in now. The alert force is airborne. Uh, we had a few takeoffs late by several minutes and one accident shortly after takeoff. But with the exception of that one, they're all off now. What about the rest? Uh, another... Me, General. Sir, an enemy missile report just in. Just a moment, sir. Just received a missile report. A missile believed to have been ballistic, detonated 10 miles southeast of Lockbourne about three minutes ago. No damage to the base reported. Uh, this report must still be confirmed. All right. Now, what about that accident on takeoff? Uh, B-47 of the 16th wing exploded shortly after takeoff. They suspect sabotage. The commander's checking the rest of his aircraft. How about the rest of the force? We're better off than I'd hoped because of that message you sent last night. 25% of our remaining force was capable of evacuating its present bases. A little less than half of these are ready to strike. Complete crew, weapon loaded, fuel and chaff loaded. Our tanker-bomber ratio looks good. All right, get General Ryan at air defense. I'll be right in. Yes, sir. Air defense, this is General Turner at offense control. 
General Ryan there. General Larson would like to talk to him and look at your board. This is General Ryan. There's a camera on the plot board. We're switching over. Jim, what's the latest on those unidentified aircraft? We have positive information that they are Soviets. We've just had a report from a Canadian interceptor who made contact with six of them. We've picked up 75 on our radar screens, and I think we can expect a lot more. We estimate that they should get to your bases in about two hours. What is the status of your force? The alert force has taken off. I'm holding off the rest as long as I can to build up the maximum strike force. We got an unconfirmed report of a missile attack near Lockbourne. Do you have anything on it? Yes, we picked that up on one of our recorders. Also two in Michigan and one in Colorado. Is there any particular pattern in the bomber attack yet? No, except that they seem to be spreading out as they get farther south. There's no concentration in any one area. How soon are you taking off for your alternate headquarters? We'll stay until the enemy's bomber attack pattern is determined. They're not likely to hurt us here with a ballistic missile. Have you spotted anything faster than a bison? No, nothing except those ballistic missiles. General Bates, the vice commander, will be in command at Hillbilly, our alternate headquarters. He's on his way. We'll have to give the Soviets credit for picking this place as an important target and launching several bombers against it. I don't doubt that they can hit it. Please keep me informed. I'll let you know when I leave. Sure will, Dick. Good luck. Dutch, what's the status of our move to alternate headquarters? The aircraft and all personnel, except your key people, are standing by at base hours. Good. Yes? General? An orbiting aircraft reported that advanced base Blue Jay was hit by an enemy missile. Extensive damage appears to have been done to the two KC-97 squadrons there. Six other advanced bases report missile explosions but no hits. Those tankers weren't supporting alert, were they? No, sir. They were part of that post-strike pool for the very deep B-52 strike. That means at least 10 less B-52s will make it back home. So the pattern is beginning to unfold. The Soviets have launched a surprise air attack. Still not knowing the enemy's intention, our offense force can only be ready to hit back. By giving up the initiative, the West must expect to receive the first blow. Fifty minutes have elapsed since the unidentified aircraft were picked up on the North American radar screens. The vice commander is en route to an alternate headquarters to take over operation of the offense force in the event headquarters is hit before it can be evacuated. Meanwhile, General Larson remains in command at headquarters. Get air defense and find out if there's any pattern yet. That's right. This is Zebra Control Europe. Urgent. Repeat. This is Zebra Control Europe. Urgent. Urgent. Turn on your screen. Go ahead, Zebra. We've just received reports that large groups of Soviet aircraft have been sighted over Germany, France, Denmark, the Netherlands, and Belgium. Our initial reports show that bombs have been dropped on airfields near Hamburg, Frankfurt, Bitburg, and Furstenfeldbruck, as well as Amsterdam, Brussels, and Tool. Reports are still coming in, uh, showing extensive damage. This is X-ray. Urgent, urgent. Hold it, Zebra. I just got an urgent from X-ray. I'm cutting off. Go ahead, X-ray. Nuclear weapons have been dropped on Osaka, Okinawa, Yokohama, and Tokyo. More information to follow. That does it. Call air defense and see if they have an established pattern of attack yet on North America. Stand by for a conference call to all our bases. Yes, sir. Air defense, this is offense control. Go ahead, offense control. We just received a report through Zebra from Supreme Allied Commander Europe and from X-ray in the Far East. The Soviets have just dropped atomic bombs on Allied airfields in Western Europe and in the Far East. Now, do you have any further information yet on the pattern of attack on this continent? No, nothing definite. We've made several widely dispersed interceptions, but their pattern of attack is still doubtful. They're not firing blanks. Unless you have something else, I'm switching off. No more out. General Turner. Yes, sir. General Larson, the command post is calling. 
This is Larson. Go ahead. Dick, this is Brooks. The President has authorized the Joint Chiefs to give the order for your forces to proceed to target. Release quick strike. Repeat. You are authorized to give the order to proceed to assign targets. Release quick strike. That is all. Acknowledge. Roger. Release quick strike and proceed to target. Acknowledged. Goodbye. Release quick strike. Have all alert force aircraft proceed to assign targets. Launch all available missiles. On these proceed to target orders, make sure you get the word to everyone. I don't want anyone turning back because we couldn't contact him. Yes, sir. Are you ready on the conference call? Yes, sir. This is General Turner. All units, all quick strike aircraft, proceed to assign targets. I say again, all quick strike aircraft, proceed to assign targets. Attention missile sites. Fire at will on designated targets. Repeat. Fire at will on designated targets. Defense Force has launched a double punch, planes and missiles. All coordinated by the senior controller and his staff under direction of the commander. Give me your attention here, please. We have now released Plan Quick Strike. Repeat, we have now released Plan Quick Strike. Our missile sites are launching at will. I want to brief you, bring you up to the minute to be sure you understand the timing. An hour ago, the alert force execution order was issued. Fifteen minutes later, this force was in the air, headed for its targets. Ten minutes ago, we canceled recall procedures and released these aircraft to carry out their full war plan missions. The remainder of the force has been prepared for evacuation. It is now being placed in strike configuration and will be committed as part of the follow-through strike force as soon as orders are given. The bulk of the alert force took off from these bases in the United States to carry out their full war plan missions. These were the takeoff base areas for the forces in the United States. The rest were launched from overseas. Most of the aircraft already deployed to forward operating bases are tankers. Some of the medium bombers took off from intermediate bases. And from the United Kingdom, North Africa, Alaska, and the Far East. These aircraft will rendezvous with their tankers in these refueling areas. Refueling reports should be coming in within the next hour. Those aircraft taking off from forward bases will approach the Soviet early warning radar net, shown here by the dotted line, In less than one half hour, lead aircraft of these other attacking forces
will reach the outer limit of the net at the same time. Meanwhile, forces from these bases are also approaching the net. At designated H hour, lead aircraft of all these forces will penetrate the net and launch a simultaneous attack. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Make sure the weather people are standing by. When this briefing is over, I want a complete recheck of the weather in all refueling areas. Yes, sir. The main attack will continue this effort and strike all elements of his air power. One hour after penetrating the net, lead aircraft will be at the position shown by this line. Remember, this is a bomb-as-you-go concept. Targets are bombed progressively. Shallow targets first, with the strike continuing to deeper targets. This enhances the penetration capability of succeeding waves. This pattern is essential because we are playing the Soviet's game. He picked the time of day. He knows we're coming. We must use every trick to overwhelm him. This line shows the positions of lead aircraft two hours after the first penetration. Targets in these areas will come under attack from the succeeding waves. In the third hour, after crossing the early warning net, the leaders of the first penetration will have progressed to these positions and will go on to strike targets in this last area. Withdrawals are generally along shortest routes to friendly post-strike bases or refueling areas. We will start getting strike reports within three hours. And we'll continue to get those reports for an additional 10 hours. This will be the critical time in the control room. And I want all reports posted as fast and as accurately as possible. This concludes the briefing. Defense control, this is air defense, over. Go ahead, air defense. This is offense control. The hostiles are beginning to establish a pattern of attack. There appears to be three main thrusts. One in the northeast, one slightly east of center, and one in the northwest. We're throwing everything at them, fighters and missiles. But we estimate that there will be enemy bombers over Loring and Fairchild in as little as 45 minutes. You may have less time if they get any help from the jet stream. That is all. What's the status of the rest of the force? Well, we can launch 345 more bombers now. We've coded this strike follow through. Launch them immediately. Then give the execution order to get all remaining aircraft in the air. When you have your acknowledgments, pass control to Hillbilly. Yes, sir. Set up a conference call. Yes, sir. Also, call operations. Tell them to have my plane and take off position in 15 minutes. Yes, sir. Some of our bombers are equipped with weapons that can be launched several hundred miles from the target. Thirty seconds to go. PDI right. PDI center. Offset check. Bombs away. Bombers of our Air Defense Force, singly and in small groups, are fanning out across the length and breadth of the aggressor nation, retaliating against Soviet air power and other war-making and war-sustaining resources.
20 hours have elapsed. The commander and his staff are at alternate headquarters. Most aircraft have landed at their post-strike bases, either at intermediate or advanced stations, or back at their home bases in the United States. Now to the reports from those who've been over the targets. On them hinge future actions, future strikes, and the war itself. In the control room of the alternate headquarters, controllers are busy tabulating the reports. From them, the planning staff will determine additional targets to be struck in subsequent attacks. Mike, what are the latest totals on aircraft return? Your board shows only about 25% of your aircraft at recovery bases. That's right, but 10 of the 14 recovery bases have been bombed, which forced the aircraft to land at other bases. How many reports have you from uh, Quick Strike and follow through? We have strike reports of two-thirds on Quick Strike, but less than one-half on follow through. Keep trying to find out where they are, huh? Will do. Guards, let's have a situation report. Uh, sir, we're having some difficulty getting information. What we have may change as more reports come in. Sergeant, uncover the operation summary board, please. Total overall results so far are aircraft scheduled, 1,545. Aircraft airborne, 1517. Free target aborts, 62. Uh, strike reports according to crew estimates, 1219. Aircraft retrieved at recovery bases, 971. Known losses, enemy territory as of two hours ago, 93. Missing, 49. Uh, major battle damage to aircraft requiring three days to repair, 62. Now, the difference between the sum of these two figures and this airborne total is 453. Of these 453 unaccounted for aircraft, sir, there should be 53 B-52s still airborne. The missing figure is high because service communications in Europe and North Africa have broken down completely. We expect radio reports soon from individual bombers groups of bombers. Crews may not realize that many of their reports aren't being forwarded. Thank you, Sergeant. Uh, sir, here's a report from Zebra. 43 B-47s and 15 B-52s were on the ground at shotgun six hours ago. We had no previous report from there. Now, that may reduce our missing number to uh, 342. But, of course, we'll have to check the B-52 tail numbers to be certain. What action have you taken on those crews down in enemy territory? We have air rescue service on the way, sir, with sufficient aircraft to support our needs in every area. Uh, they've been sending reports in every two hours. Tell them I don't want reports. I want my crews picked up. Yes, sir. Uh, next general is the air base status. Go ahead. Uh, in operations so far, we've used... Uh, we've used 121 bases in the United States and 42 of the available bases overseas. Uh, communications in the overseas areas are bad, but uh, these are the figures we have. Available bases in the United States, 72. In overseas areas, 67. Bases in use in the United States, 72. In overseas areas, 37. Uh, bases damaged in the United States, 20. Overseas, 20. This figure includes all missile sites. Uh, bases destroyed in the United States, 46. And in overseas areas, 16 known damaged. Uh, I beg your pardon, 16 known destroyed includes all IRBM sites. Our overseas data is unreliable, but we do know that there are two usable bases in North Africa. Three in the United Kingdom, three in Alaska, five in Canada in the Northeast area, and uh, two in the Far East. We're sure there are more, sir, but that's all we can back up with reports. How many tankers are operating from the Canadian bases? 73, sir. Well, let's not schedule any more bombers or tankers in there. They'll be looking for cripples for sure. Uh, pass that to operations plans and numbered Air Force controls. Yes, sir. 
What's your latest total on aircraft losses, Dutch? Uh, in addition to the 93 lost over enemy territory, we know we've lost 387 bombers, 237 tankers on the ground. Some of these had just returned from their missions. 258 of these bombers were B-52s. That's bad. But it's a lot better than it might have been. Sir, if there are no other questions, intelligence is now ready to brief. Go ahead. Sir, we have 625 strike reports in and 182 debriefing reports, but our evaluation is limited. This is a summary of the majority of the targets we attacked on our quick strike and follow through strikes. 33 missile sites, 302 enemy air bases, 12 long range air army headquarters, 18 atomic weapons storage sites, 57 fighter and tactical air control centers, 48 government control centers, and 12 enemy transport centers. We're waiting for the strike photos to compute the actual destructions. But we do have the bomb damage assessment mission photo for target M. Let me see it. This is the map of the target, with the initial point here and the aiming point here. This is the radar prediction on which the crew was briefed. And here is the outline of the lake, which is on the map. This is a blow up of the picture of the radar scope as the bomb detonated. I know all that. Where did the bomb hit? Within 300 feet of the aiming point. The target was destroyed according to our first estimate. Never mind the rest. Send me the analysis when you get it. Did we get the Schwerskev and Kutzka airfield complexes? Yes, sir. We have final reports on both of those. Good. Brief me on those later in my office. I want enemy air battle targets we're not sure are rescheduled as quickly as possible. Yes, sir. What were the effects of the Soviet attack on the United States? Sir, we have them plotted over here. Sir, we have failed in our primary mission deterrence. However, our secondary mission of destroying the enemy is apparently fulfilled. Catastrophic damage has been inflicted on the United States. We have only spasmodic communications with the most highly affected areas. Most of these were through isolated ham radio operators. Other information has been pieced together from the reports of visual observation by returning bomber crews. Total personnel casualties are estimated to exceed 60 million. This includes approximately 20 million wounded. As we expected, they threw the bulk of their bombers and their best weapons against the defense force. However, they threw a strong effort against the atomic energy industries, the communication control centers. The New York, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Chicago, and Los Angeles industrial areas were completely destroyed. Boston, Buffalo, Richmond, Knoxville, St. Louis, Omaha, Denver, Salt Lake, Seattle, and San Francisco suffered severe damage and high casualties. Their effort reaches as far south as Fort Worth, Dallas, and Miami. It will be some time before we have a complete report. Our contacts with civil defense are only spasmodic. You will receive a complete report as soon as the facts are available. The President and the Joint Chiefs of Staff are safe and at the alternate command post. There appear to have been two waves of enemy aircraft, separated by about four hours. Oddly enough, Air Defense advises that the only unidentified aircraft they've spotted in the last 10 hours have turned out to be friendlies. Sir, the next briefing phase will be by operations. Thanks, Red. Sergeant, uh, let's have a look at Foxtrot, please. <laughs> Sir, we're operating under planned Foxtrot. The next attack is scheduled for takeoff in seven hours. It consists of 123 strike aircraft, 52 are support missions for Europe and the Far East. 
What are the remaining 71? Eight new airfield targets and five new weapon storage sites which were picked up during quick strike. We have two bombers committed to each. The remainder are divided. 25 against airfield targets we missed during quick strike and follow through and 20 on control centers we didn't schedule. Reassess those control centers right away. We'll attack only those you consider imperative. Yes, sir. Double up the attack on their airfields, along with the other targets intelligence releases, and revert to positive recall. Dawes, get me the Joint Chiefs at Command Post. Yes, sir. What are you planning after Foxtrot? Uh, Operation Clean Sweep. That calls for about 200 bombers 24 hours after Foxtrot. Sir, the Joint Chiefs of Staff are on the line. <clears throat> Bill, I'm sending out some cleanup and theater support attacks in seven hours. I've got a feeling that after the next strike, we may have control of the air. The next 24 hours should tell. In any event, I'm not going after his industry as such for 31 hours. All future attacks will have positive recall procedures. Does CIA have anything? Yes, we have sufficient weapons for at least three days' operations. Please keep me advised. In war for survival, how soon can a nation surrender? When its military power is destroyed and its communications and governmental centers shattered, we must give him every chance, take every precaution to ensure that no bomb falls after he acknowledges defeat. strike force, its first attack completed, follows up its offensive. The main effort concentrated against Soviet air power, airfields, bomb and fuel depots. Already, more destructive power has been delivered than has been expended in all the wars in the history of man. is now D-Day plus four, four days after the first attack. Sir, we now have definite indications of our success in the air offensive. During the past 36 hours, no nuclear weapons have detonated outside of the USSR. Our attacks have reduced the Soviet Air Force to a handful of aircraft operating from substandard bases. These bases are being located and attacked by our reconnaissance bomber force. Here is our bomb damage since the first strike effort. Assessment. 100 enemy air bases attacked, 94 completely destroyed, and six heavily damaged. Only four bombers have been lost. These are believed to have been operational rather than combat losses. Central Intelligence Agency reports that 18 unofficial requests for ceasefire have been received by radio. Supreme Allied Commander York reports almost complete disintegration of resistance by surface forces. They must quit. They have no other choice. We have the air, we have the power, and they know it.
central part of the United States, over 100 feet below the surface of the earth, surrounded by thick, reinforced concrete. In the event of an attack, this entire structure can be sealed, protected against penetration of radioactive fallout. Through those doors and around the corner is the operations control room of the Long Range Air Offense Force. Thank you, Sergeant. From this room, the force throughout the world is controlled and monitored 24 hours a day, in peace as it would be in war. This force is a combat-ready offense force. It is a deterrent force dedicated to the prevention of war, any war, large or small. This offense force is complemented by the Joint Allied Early Warning Air Defense System. Offense control, Colonel Dawes. Good. Uh, recheck the weather in that area. The last forecast indicated thunderstorms. Right. Gentlemen, from this room, we control the entire long-range air offense force of 3,000 bombers, tankers, and support aircraft. It is a joint chief's efficiency in progress throughout the world. Some forces are being deployed. Some are being shifted. Some are special missions to improve combat effectiveness. These missions are going on 24 hours a day and averaging the high activity periods with the lows we have 10 to 15 percent of the total force airborne at all times. To support this activity, an aerial refueling operation takes place every three and a half minutes. See these clocks here? Never before in military history has time been so important. But of course our true mission here is to control this offense force. As I have said, it is a deterrent force. It's a force which we control in readiness to perform air strikes against an enemy, and in the event of war, when it would make these strikes. Sergeant, let's see plan war dance. Yes, sir. War dance is a typical war plan for our heavy units. The fate of the nation may well be determined on such a board as this. This plan of force application may be adjusted depending on the world situation. All the information needed to control the force is here. This board and other boards behind it dictate routes, refueling points, target areas, return points, and all the other things necessary to make the plan work. If the button's ever pressed, we're all set to go. You'll notice this ring of bases encircling the enemy. Every day we're running exercises in and around these bases with no formal pattern, deterrent force. But the enemy could someday gain greater strength and surpass our deterrent force. This must never happen. Nobody wins in nuclear war because both sides are sure to suffer terrible damage. Nevertheless, it is imperative that we make sure that the enemy can never impose his will upon us by military force. Despite our efforts to deter them, the communists may resort to general war. This is not considered likely to happen before the year 1960. If they start a war, this is what will happen. The Early Warning Air Defense Net 
of the United States and her allies would pick up the first signs of unidentified aircraft. Defense control, Virgin. This is air defense. Go ahead, air defense. We have a large number of unidentified aircraft coming in from the north. Our television camera covers our board at this moment. Roger, air defense, we see them. Sergeant Williams, stand by to establish a conference call to all bases. General Larson, please. This is General Larson, go ahead. Sir, would you turn on your screen? A large number of unidentified aircraft have just appeared. Right. Go ahead, air defense. This is air defense. Large groups of unidentified aircraft have been reported at Baffin and Prince of Wales Islands and near Banks Island. Reports from Alaska indicate unusual activity in northeast Siberia. We're considering reclassifying. Some of these exercises follow good tactics, but always we mix in many bad tactics which we would never actually use. Thus, we keep the enemy from forming any idea of our real plans and therefore from making his own plans to meet us. He knows we may use these bases, but he can have no idea which we'll use today, tomorrow, or if a war should start. And he knows we can launch our attack without them. During the time period 1958 through 1960, the United States has an offensive strike force sufficient to deter war. It's an effective intercontinental nuclear air force secure as we can make it within our resources. A sizable portion of it is secure from destruction by the enemy, regardless of what offensive and defensive action he takes against it. The size, composition, and alertness of the offense force is such that the enemy realizes that an attack on the United States would likely mean committing national suicide. A substantial portion of this force is maintained on constant alert ready to begin taking off within a few minutes after receipt of the order to launch. This means that even with no more warning than that provided by our early warning radars, a force of hundreds of long-range nuclear bombers would be on their way toward vital targets in the enemy heartland before their bombers could reach our bomber bases. This constant combat readiness is the surest way to prevent war. This massive capability is the deterrent of wars. The more we disperse, the larger the portion of the force that can be launched on a few minutes' notice, and the more difficult it is for the enemy to convince himself of his ability to destroy it. The enemy cannot prevent the takeoff of these bombers on alert, and the enemy cannot prevent our penetration into his heartland as long as we maintain our relatively stronger staff force, which is poised, ready to strike targets anywhere in the world from bases in the United States and overseas. It is the most powerful military force in world history. We are in contact with this force through the most advanced communication system ever built. It affords practically instantaneous communication with over 100 bases in the United States and our many bases overseas. Closed circuit television provides immediate information to the senior officers of the staff enabling them to make vital decisions instantaneously. To transmit these decisions to the force, we have this red phone alert circuit. This circuit allows us, by merely dialing 10 digits, to seize or override all other lines and set up in a matter of seconds a conference call to the control centers on all our bases. All such conversations are recorded on these tape recorders here. Sitting over there are the controllers. For effective control of the long-range offense force, the world is divided into three areas. Each man controls the aircraft in a given area. This is a deterrent force with a primary mission of keeping a global war from starting. If we are to be successful in this mission, we have to have plans, plans of all kinds, detailed blueprints, so to speak, that have been worked out far in advance. These are flexible plans and can be changed to meet any contingency. Let's have a look at some of the displays. Andy, uh, take over here, will you please?
We call this the big board. These panels show 